2018 has been a really great year for EE with a number of technical advancements clearly yielding fruit based on the results of independent network benchmarks. Back in August, EE was crowned by Rootmetrics as the best network for the fifth year in a row. Meanwhile, slightly closer to the current date, P3 Connect also awarded EE as the best network only a few days ago. These wide scale, highly scientific tests very much match the results of the less scientific network testing that I've done on my own and with Jake, for example, where in the case of London recently, EE took a lead and actually in the test that we did earlier in the year, EE also won. Meanwhile, in the December hull tests that I did, EE took an absolutely astounding victory for download and upload performance. So what kind of upgrades have EE been doing? Well, by far the biggest is the Huawei RRU5507 upgrade. These Huawei remote radios are dual band 1800 and 2100 megahertz simultaneously and each of the 5507 remote radios is to transmit for receive. What EE do is pair up two of them on each sector to then have 44R, 1800 MHz and 2100 MHz 4G. The remote radios completely replace the older 2T2R MRFU radios that would usually be located in the cabin of the site. And in addition, they also now carry most of the 2100 MHz spectrum as well because the 2100 MHz 3G carriers that would typically all have been carried on Nokia Flexi stacks have mostly, well three out of four of them, been refarmed to 4G on 2100 MHz as part of this process. This leaves only the first 3G carrier which is UARFCN 10761 on the Nokia Flexi equipment. The typical functional unit for the site doesn't just have 5507s mounted remotely though. These sites also typically have Huawei 3262 remote radios which carry the two carriers of 2600 MHz as well. In 4G bandwidth terms, the 5507 upgrade means that these EE masts have 2 by 30 MHz of 1800 MHz 4G across two carriers, so EAR, FCN, 1667 and 1811, of course with 44R as I said, but also 2 by 15 MHz of 4G on 2100 MHz which again is 44R. Add on top of that the 2 by 35 MHz of 2600 MHz 4G, so EAR FCNs 3350 and 3179, and additionally 2 by 5 MHz of 800 MHz on actually a growing number of these, you then get a total 4G bandwidth amount which is 2 by 85 megahertz, so 85 megahertz downlink and 85 megahertz uplink on 4G, which is an absolutely colossal amount of 4G spectrum. And of course, what you can't forget is that more than half of that, so 2 by 45 megahertz, is also 44R, which is important for all users but for those with devices which can take advantage of it, the speed jump can be really quite enormous. Not only in good conditions, yielding the nice several hundred megabits per second, but also for being able to stream a high definition video deep in a building, for example. Those extra antennas are really very helpful. I have some screenshots of various configurations at the bottom here. Thing to note is that 
sites that get these upgrades tend to be very busy so while the theoretical throughput for all of them might be quite significantly above one gigabit per second getting over several hundred megabits per second is still relatively good although part of the reason for that is because of the stream limitations of the current range of flagship devices i.e. there's not a mobile device out currently that will be able to use all the carriers and all the streams available from one of these sites. However, of course, the master having all of them means that lots of users can take advantage of the capacity. The next new technology has also found its home in built up urban environments and that is small cells. So these are made by Nokia and provide very localized capacity to say very busy pedestrian walkways and business areas where there's a huge amount of footfall of people that would create a high load hotspot. These small cells operate on dedicated spectrum for 2600 megahertz, so they use EAR FCN 3026, which is 2 by 15 megahertz, and that sits just below the conventional macro EAR FCNs of 3350 and 3179. And this dedicated spectrum means that these small cells aren't going to be fighting with the macro cells around. So the signal to noise ratio will be very good because there won't be other sites overlapping on that spectrum range and therefore the spectral efficiency is much higher. The 1800 MHz is using a different EAR FCN to 1811 but occupies very much the same spectrum being only shifted by 0.3 megahertz however users who get automatically connected to the site will invariably be very close to them so even if the macro umbrella sites have 1811 on them and therefore much the same spectrum as the 1808 the SINR and signal quality indicators should still be very good so therefore the bits per hertz should still be very high. On the subject of 1811 and 1800 MHz 4G, suburban sites outside the city centre ones which have been getting the 5507 upgrade have been getting 1811, so the second 1800 MHz 4G carrier added to them. Now, with these sites, they're still using the conventional MRFU radios and the MIMO still to T2R. However, it is still a 50% increase in 4G bandwidth if just going from a standard 2x 20 MHz EAR FCN 1667 site. And the download speeds that can be attained in real life can still be over 200 megabits per second. In addition, because a lot of phones support contiguous 1800 MHz 4G in the upload direction for uplink aggregation, upload speeds around the 100 megabit per second mark are also quite easily possible as well. So definitely a very pleasing upgrade to be seeing spreading around the place. Last but not least is 5G. EE has been doing various non-standalone 5G demonstrations throughout London in the latter part of this year, including at Canary Wharf, where they had a demo pod in a kind of converted container, complete with a temporary mast with 5G massive MIMO panel and passive panel as well. So these demos have been non-standalone, so they have 4G anchors, which were using an array of different EAR FCNs. EAR FCN 472 replaces 3G carrier 10786. Meanwhile, EAR FCN 522 we've already spoken about 
with regards to the 5507 upgrade project. They also used EAR FCN 3029 which is very similar to the small cell band 7 EAR FCN of 3026 but it's just shifted 0.3 megahertz a little bit like the small cell 1808 versus macro 1811 for 1800 megahertz. The lower middle image shows the ports at the base of the passive antenna that was installed on the temporary mast at the Canary Wharf demo and that has four blue tags and four yellow tags, the blue tags being for 2100 MHz, i.e. the L21, and the yellow ones are for 2600, so L26. And at this Canary Wharf demo, they achieved speeds of over one gigabit per second. EE have big ambitions for 5G in 2019 as well with six launch cities followed by a further 10 which will be getting 5G in the year. I have been monitoring EE 5G upgrade applications and it is clear that they have two 5G deployment strategies. The first involves using massive MIMO in the form of AAU 5613s by Huawei and the latter is using Huawei's 5258ATAR remote radios and then passive panels. These two strategies each have pros and cons. So the former, Massive MIMO, has better coverage footprint and also delivers more capacity to an area, but at the cost of high electromagnetic emission which potentially complicates deployment in areas with already significant 4G spectrum deployed and therefore a relatively high existing electromagnetic field level. ATAR, while the coverage is less and the capacity is less, the electromagnetic emission is also a lot less, making deployment in areas with existing high levels of electromagnetic fields a lot easier. Massive MIMO panels are also quite heavy as well. Thanks for watching this whistle stop tour of EE's advancements in the year 2018 and a little look at what they are going to be doing in 2019 in terms of 5G. On a completely different note, you'll probably notice that the jumper that I'm wearing is EE Christmas branded and there are some other EE branded objects around my room and that's just because sort of inexplicably on my birthday a package arrived with some EE branded goodies like this jumper for example.